the building a strong relationship between competency-based patterns and career technical education conference call. My friend, and I'll be operator for today's call. At the time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Looking at the question and answer session, please note this conference is being recorded. I'm going to call over to Alyssa Peltzman. Please go ahead. Thank you to all of you for taking the time to join us today. It's a pleasure to partner with CASE and the National Association of State Directors of CTE to advance our thinking and produce this brief. During competency-based pathways and policies related to assessment, accountability, and graduation requirements for the past three years. We realize that a growing number of states and districts see competency-based pathways as a valuable approach to ensuring all students have the time and support they need to reach college and career-ready expectations. Competency-based pathways provide flexibility to master each set of skills and knowledge necessary to meet the learning objectives before they go move on. It creates opportunities to tailor support to the specific needs of each student, rather than sort of keep in the middle. As building a learning environment that focuses on supporting, evaluating, and reporting on students based on their current demonstrated level of mastery. As a result, all students build a stronger academic foundation and are better able to master the knowledge and skills to prepare them for their next steps after graduation. A study towards competency-based pathways and policies has the potential to open new opportunities for students to learn, demonstrate their learning, and to do in meaningful ways that build towards their ultimate readiness. Students in the environment should be able to access engaging opportunities that are grounded in application and career aspirations a central and grounding focus of CTE. As such, an opportunity for state leaders, leaders committed to advancing rigorous competency-based pathways, as well as those who have been committed to advancing rigorous CTE learning experiences to identify leverage points to ensure the systems are aligned and mutually reinforcing. Strong relationships, in turn, may encourage students to learn, demonstrate, and apply the full range of college and career-ready knowledge and skills, including technical and employability skills that are so demanded in the workplaces of today and tomorrow. With that, I'd like to re reiterate my thanks to Kate. I want to acknowledge and thank my colleague Andrew Vallant for his efforts to share this. I'm going to over to Andrew, and even as I do so, I really want to encourage all of you on the phone today to actively participate through the chat box, during the Q&A, or feel free to reach out to us after this call. We hope this is a first conversation, not the first conversation. Lisa. So before we get started with the webinar, I'm just going to run through a few quick details. First off, if you get logged out of the webinar, please use the exact same link that you used initially to log back in and use the same dial-in for uh, dial-in information as well. If you need operator assistance at any time, simply dial star zero, and participants um, and participants will be muted throughout the call um, during the speech or presentations, but you will have the uh, opportunity to offer questions during the Q&A session, and our editor will assist us in um, allowing you to unmute. You can also, as Alyssa mentioned, write in questions using the chat box, which we can ask verbally of the presenters. Our agenda today, we are joined by several CTE and CBP experts from both the state and national level. We'll be from Kate Blazerin Kramer, Associate Executive Director of the National Association of State Directors of Career and Technical Education Consortium. We also have with us Steve DeWitt, the Deputy Director of the Association for Career and Technical Education. From the state level, we'll be hearing from Tom Thompson, Education Specialist of the Oregon Department of Education, and Suzanne Vita Loud, the Associate, an associate Consultant with the Connecticut Department of Education. First off, Kate and I will be providing an overview of a recently, our recently published brief on this issue that was released by both ACHIEVE and the state directors. Next, Tom and Sue will be describing their efforts within Connecticut and Oregon to uh, begin alignment and highlight examples of this work in action. You'll have the opportunity to share your questions following their presentation. We'll then hear brief reflections from Steve on key themes that stakeholders uh, that um, should address and areas for improved alignment prior to closing out the webinar. 
Before diving into a discussion about uh, alignment between CTE and CVP, we thought it would be valuable to first clearly explain how we define each term. This slide articulates Achieve's definition of competency-based pathways, or CVP for short, which was originally adapted from the competency works definition. It encompasses the following points. First, students upon demonstration of mastery of specific knowledge and skills in place of seat time. Also, in competency-based systems, there is a, a focus on explicit, measurable, and transferable learning objectives that inherently empower students. Learning is a meaningful and positive learning experience, as students also receive rapid and differentiated support based on their individual needs. Outcomes go beyond simply for order knowledge and skills and really emphasize the application and creation of knowledge. And then finally, competency-based systems should encourage students to develop the skills and dispositions important to succeed in college, careers, and in citizenship. Uh, so with that, I'm now going to turn it over to Kate to do a brief run-through of uh, the state direct definition of career and technical education. Thanks, and um, this is Kate Blaudron with the State Directors Association. Thank you to everyone who joined. Um, thank you to our partners at Achieve uh, for the opportunity to really dig into this, this really timely and important issue about um, sort of the opportunity of really connecting the dots between competency-based pathways and CTE. So we thought just as it was helpful to sort of set expectations of what we mean by competency-based pathways, um, putting out um, sort of we meant the construct around career technical education, which can, can mean different things to different folks. From our perspective, um, and for the perspective of this, this paper and the research in today's discussion, we're defining it quite broadly, really, as any education that is preparing learners for the career of their choice. Um, that includes the technical, academic, and employability knowledge and skills that will get them in that, that level of preparation. Um, the paper, um, throughout today, we'll really be talking about the intersection between CT and, and Based pathways and focusing on quality CTE, right? This is only going to happen for those programs that are really meeting the rigorous um, program of study definition, which is really focusing on um, having a sequence of courses and expectations that extends from secondary into post secondary that's anchored in rigorous standards, that's aligned with the needs of industries. That specificity so includes both the early um, awareness and exploratory expectations and then moves into more occupationally specific knowledge and skills over time that has multiple entry and exit points and is anchored in the attainment of an industry credential or post-secondary degree. So this is a fairly broad as well as very rigorous definition of what we really mean by CTE and, and all the opportunities that it, it provides. I'll turn to Andrew. Thank you, Kate. So we're going to try out a poll for um, for seminar today. Um, we have a question in front of you. Who is currently interested in your state in align, aligning CBP and CTE? Um, I'm going to open the poll question right now, and you should have a little box on, on the right side for polling. Uh, open that box, and you can choose one of the answers. So we have no current interest. Um, maybe you're the only one interested in your entire state. Um, also, educators, district leaders, state policymakers, employers, third-party organizations, or, or other categories. So I'll leave this open for another 15 minutes or so. Got a lot of people participating. Five seconds or so left. See the poll results in front of you right now. Um, it, it looks like a pretty broad smattering. We have a lot of people who are, uh, well, good news is no one, there are no examples of where there is no current interest. So that's, that's a benefit. Uh, that's a, a positive. We all have a lot of interest in amongst educators, district leaders, and state policymakers. Um, a last person, perhaps, with amongst the employer community and, and the third-party organizations. Um, we've had maybe half the participants not respond. So um, it looks like it's pretty even across the board on, on this one. The next slide. Um, 
we'd like to do a, a resource spotlight on the, the recently released brief. Um, so, as she mentioned earlier, Chief and the State Directors are very excited to share this, this brief titled Building a Strong Relationship Between Competency-Based Pathways and Career Technical Education. So, this brief came about was in the spring of 2015, earlier this year, Achieve and the State Directors held a series of conversations with a number of state leaders in competency-based pathways states, um, which culminated in a convening to really clarify what are the opportunities for alignment between CTE and CBP systems and where are there areas that really need to be addressed and what, what are the major challenges. Conversations resulted in this brief, which captures a few main things, um, three, three primary points. First off, it, it really explores the leverage points and challenges that exist within states. Uh, second, it offers state and district examples where this work has already started, and we really tried to pull from those examples in putting together this webinar today. And then last, it highlights specific key questions or considerations state leaders, district leaders should be thinking about as they're interested in this alignment. So with that, I'll turn it over to Kate to do a brief run through of kind of the high points of the paper. Thank you. So when we started this work, um, we started with the operating assumption that CTE and common space pathways really actually reinforcing um, and sort of towards the same goal of getting students to become college and career ready. Um, and part of what makes them mutually reinforcing is that they have a lot of common goals, they have a lot of common elements, and there's a lot of ways that each of those forms and activities could really be leveraged to advance and support one another. Uh, as we sort of did this work, we honed in on five specific leverage points or, or commonalities, which I'm going to walk through now to sort of show how this, this plays out. So, next slide. Um, is the notion of contextualized teaching and learning. Um, this is very much the hallmark of high-quality CTE and certainly um, core to getting competency-based pathways uh, relevant, right? So it's really around the integration of instruction, the breaking down of those silos at the classroom and instructional level to really allow the academics to be applied um, and contextualized and to have the more technical content really be anchored in, in those core academic skills. And so this is out um, in, you know, co-taught courses um, in interdisciplinary projects and courses and assignments, as well as a number of states um, that have developed some robust policies around um, doing credit equivalency. So recognizing that, um, creating a process, recognizing that a specific course within agriculture or health science absolutely could be meeting science, science standards and science course requirements. The next leverage point that we pulled out was around the notion of self-directed student pathways, which obviously is at the soul of common to based pathways, giving students the ability to exercise their choice and voice and to have the experiences and the competencies that really, um, and the way they're demonstrating those competencies that really have meaning to them and put them on the path they want to be, um, that's supported through individualized learning plans, and from our perspective, that all has to be anchored in their career pathway and their career goals. Um, absolutely having interest is, is important, but if you are not you're not anchored in some plan for what students will do after they leave high school, really missing a key component um, of, of really, you know, I think you're doing a disservice to students. So having that career at the core and the heart of that pathway is a way to really um, further break down um, and better connect the two. Point um, is around extended experience learning opportunities. Um, this is, you know, some that is been getting a lot of discussion and attention um, within the CTE world. We often talk about this as work-based learning, um, and that can be both happening at a work site through an internship um, or a pre-apprenticeship, but also, you know, through simulated experiences um, and school-based enterprises and other experiences that actually happen within the school walls. Um, it also play out through independent study, uh, again, within the CT space through participation in career technical student organizations, which are about leadership development and provide students to compete um, in sort of really rigorous experiences. And for, you know, ELOs are very much part of the competency-based um, sort of uh, reform and the, the construct, but where CT can really add more to that is about bringing employers into that conversation and, and really the recruitment and engagement of them, um, as well as really making sure that in 
the academic skills that both the technical skills and those really critical employability or 21st century skills are really built into those experiences and measured along the way. Then the leverage points um, or commonalities are a focus on project-based learning and performance-based assessment. So project-based learning um, kind of relates back to the notion of extended learning opportunities um, and contextualized teaching and learning that making sure students um, through, it's through demonstration of competency, whether it's just through their regular coursework, are really solving and addressing real world authentic problems. Um, and the truth is a lot of general education or core academic teachers don't necessarily know how to make projects or problems really authentic because they're just further away from that work. And so CT teachers can really bring a lot to the table in making sure that the authenticity is there in, that, in, that, um, in those opportunities and experiences. And finally, um, performance-based assessments, as Andrew spoke earlier, assessments are core to competency-based pathways and making sure that they're and reliable and that in addition to traditional assessment systems, you're, you're really augmenting it and bringing those additional experiences that students to demonstrate in different and meaningful ways. And so whether that's through capstone or portfolio um, experiences, which again are often a hallmark of high quality CT programs um, that are, are, you know, to get at the 21st century skills, um, to get at the sort of authentic problem and project-based learning um, in a way to, you know, capture the learning that might be happening um, outside the school through work-based learning and CTSOs. So again, you know, we see these being, all of these elements exist within high quality career uh, education program study. All of these exist within high quality competency based pathways. So it's really about how do you make sure that we're connecting the dots, we're strengthening them, and, and you, where one might be falling down, we can use each of these systems to really strengthen the other. So, to you. So, yes, there are lever leverage points and opportunities to really synergize between CT and CBP. However, um, in analyzing this within states and from, from conversations with state leaders, there are a lot of challenges as well and considerations that need to be addressed before, before really moving forward. Um, we've identified a few major buckets where, where those can really fall into. One, just communications and stakeholder engagement. How can you really bring all the right people to the, the, the same table? Um, equity concerns are a major issue in that you uh, need to ensure that um, all, all pathways are, are high quality and rigorous pathways. There's also the, the difficulty in building local capacity um, around data systems and tracking students across learning experiences. Uh, and there are a few other issues that we'll get to during the webinar as well. So um, I want to talk about these absent of real world context. So I, I figure we can really get into um, some of the major considerations states are grappling with by hearing from two state leaders. So I'm going to be um, I'll turn it over to Kate to introduce uh, both of our state leaders. Thanks. So, you know, what's what's really important to, you know, anchoring this work, um, anchoring, you know, the roundtable we, we held that sort of was the, the baseline for getting this paper together. Um, the paper itself and then today's conversation is really looking at, you know, where states are in this process. And the truth is no state is hitting all those leverage points um, fully comprehensively. This is very much a process, an ongoing process, but we um, today will be having the opportunity from two states that are hit on that first point that Andrew just showed about the intentionality, right, and really making sure that CTE is part of the conversation, it's part of the framework, it's part of the vision um, as they build and, and put into place in the case of order proficiency-based system, in the case of Connecticut, their mastery-based system. And so hopefully um, by sort of highlighting two states that are in very different places within the processes, we can sort of spark some conversation about how this might look and work um, and play out in other states. So we're going to open with Oregon um, Thompson um, at the Department of Education who will sort of walk through some of the, some of what Oregon over the past couple years around the graduation requirements, some of the newer um, initiatives they have in place. Um, and with some local examples in that throughout. So, Tom, I'll turn it over to you. Um, so, one thing that, that I wanted to do is just uh, quickly uh, a little bit of background here. We're using a uh, proficiency language in Oregon. If you can go to the next slide, please. The proficiency definition that we use in Oregon really is uh, very much like what's being used in the competency based language, just um, historically, have been use the term proficiency. I wanted to put this slide up there so that people have a 
secretary be able to look at the similarities between what's been described earlier in this webinar and what we are doing in Oregon. Okay, next. We have a history of proficiency-based education. Um, 2002 was really maybe the first marking point to where uh, proficiency education was described uh, in, in documents out of the Oregon Department of Education, uh, make it permissive for, for school districts to apply proficiency. At the point then, um, we still need to understand what that actually meant. So in 2004, a number of pilot projects were involved in, in uh, pr providing credit through proficiency. And then um, after those pilot projects, we went through a time when we were uh, changing our diploma requirements. So in 2007, the idea of proficiency was became an integral part of the diploma requirements in Oregon. Go ahead. The, um, uh, the policies that currently exist then are a mix of things. Uh, first of all, we want to make really clear that uh, that C time is not completely gone. We still have 990 hours required in high school in order to uh, complete the uh, uh, to you know to complete a full year in academic year. But what's interesting is the permissive language within our, our programs within the schools allows a lot of flexibility. So the new graduation requirements, or they're not as new anymore, uh, allows uh, various ways to award credit. Proficiency is permitted. And actually, within the last year, the seat time requirements, the typical Carnegie unit of 130 seat hours, has actually been removed from policy language. So um, it's all described in terms of proficiency. Uh, the essential, the, the parts of uh, the assessment where you're trying to uh, see what students understand, we have uh, standard assessments where a smarter balance state, uh, and state testing is an option, but at the same time, there are other options that are available. Other testing options are available, identified statewide, and then also students can use work samples scored through scoring guides produced by Oregon to uh, what their proficiency is in particular content areas. So there are multiple options for students to demonstrate their proficiency. And finally, one of the requirements for the graduation um, for diploma is to have a personal plan and profile where students uh, identify what their needs will be in collaboration with parents and teachers and uh, what are the means in which they might meet those needs. So that's kind of the structure of what we have. It's a permissive policy. And uh, I'm going to, the next slide is just a quick look at what's the difference between a past time constant system with Carnegie units. And in this case, this would be an example of uh, an eight courses, about 130 seat time might exist in a year. And students would get credit for those courses in a total of 990 hours. If we go to the next slide, the difference then in a standards constant system or proficiency-based system is that the um, time is not the important piece here. You still have 990 hours, but you can see the various things in here. Um, some of that could be, um, uh, the standards could be met in shorter times, as in that red block. Uh, potentially, a student may need a longer amount of time, as in the orange. That green one off the bar really indicates that you could earn credit outside of any instructional standard uh, in process within a school. A lot of options, including through all of those options, you may be able to add other um, through a proficiency-based system, may be able to add credit for other opportunities because of the adjustments in time. Okay, next slide. What else? Uh, take a few minutes and describe two situations that are competency-based um, situations in Oregon. So if we go to the next slide. Uh, a technical center. Oregon is primarily uh, does CTE within a. Um, high school setting. We have one uh, traditional technical center and there are other uh, not traditional centers out there. Uh, but in this in this technical center, they have a really great example of where in their agricultural program, and they've had this for a number of years, students can earn biology credit. The whole credit arrangement was done on a uh, collaborative thing uh, with a science teacher and um, students then present a portfolio of evidence to get that credit. situation where we have um, the, uh, the, there was a proficiency-based system. It was entirely proficiency-based. They never did the stress test on this. They've set this aside for a moment, and we'll talk about some of the issues that are involved in that real quickly. So, learn of the proficiency. We've got
got a couple paths that we're taking at this time to enhance uh, the uh, opportunity for districts and centers to be able to do proficiency-based education. Assessment, uh, we're looking at um, working with teachers to be able to develop performance tasks and uh, use those in assessment and tying those to proficiency. That turns out to be a very difficult task and, and we're working on that. Uh, we've done some pilots on that to try to understand that better. We're also working on contextualized teaching through math and CT, literacy and CT, where national projects, Oregon has been part of that. We did our own R&D project where we incorporated context into math classes and we have a new grant program going out to try to extend this even further that we call Math in Real Life and it's a professional development project that will start this year. And we need to develop models for proficiency credit in career technical education. We're using a, uh, we're starting off with some work that's done in Washington that's uh, really been pushed by the business community and uh, looking at course equivalency and how do you actually use permissive language and make that actually work within schools, provide that particular opportunity for students so that they could earn biology, math, whatever credit through CTE courses. Um, there, we can do that now, but it's, the districts have been reluctant to do that, and so we need more models of how that might work. I think that's my piece at this point. Um, um, I think you gave us a lot. Well, we're gonna we're gonna circle back and dig in on a couple of the things you talked about. And um, a reminder to anybody with questions, feel free. We'll have some moderated Q and A in a little bit. Um, but now I want to move over to my home state of Connecticut, um, where Suzanne uh, Vita Loud will be talking about some new um, work and, and policy changes that are occurring um, in Connecticut around mastery-based learning, um, and where CT fits in that. So I will turn over to Suzanne. Thank you. Uh, greetings from Connecticut. Um, I'm here to speak to you today about work that we are doing with mastery-based learning, and that's what we call it here. We are definitely newer to uh, competency-based education than Oregon is, and, uh, but we are, we are moving forward and we're very excited about it. Uh, just to give you some background about Connecticut, we are a small state, uh, but we're traditionally counted as a very high-knowledge state. And we're home to many world-class aerospace manufacturers, bioscience innovators, and leading financial and insurance industries. We also have an aging workforce. In recent years, uh, companies, employers in Connecticut haven't been reticent about letting us know that they're facing a struggle uh, to find the highly skilled workers that they really need in their in their businesses. And they've cited employability and technical skills, some advanced skills, and the interpersonal and teamwork skills as areas uh, that they want to see improved upon. I think CTE is the vehicle to get us there. Connecticut, always small state, but also facing achievement gap with our students. And so, of our policy context, um, we really move towards uh, serious educational reform. So in terms of mastery-based learning, uh, we can go to the next slide. Kent uh, had passage of an act effective by 1st, 2013, and the statute in essence gave local and regional boards of education the option to move beyond traditional seat time requirements and allowed them to take the option of granting credit toward graduation by demonstration of mastery. So it's, we're, we're very clear here that we do have the flexibility and people are welcoming that, that it is flexible, it is mandate. I'd like to mention um, our current graduation requirements. At this time, we're at 20 credits for graduation, but commencing with a graduating class of 2021, we're going to have a new minimum requirement of 25 credits. Again, those 25 credits, and that language hasn't gone away yet, those can be granted through a demonstration of mastery based on competencies and performance standards. And in that 25 credits, it's kind of noteworthy that we do have a two-credit CTE or life skills elective requirement. Those could take the form of a community service piece, a personal finance course online or in the classroom, 
a public speaking learning opportunity. It, there's a lot of flexibility with that too. So with these new requirements of effective 2021, we have that students will complete a senior demonstration project and they'll be granted one credit for that. That is seen as a rigorous capstone experience that puts together for our students. And um, I will be speaking shortly on an example uh, from one of our schools, one of the intensive high schools, and how they are kind of connecting the dots uh, and using that project. So one more thing of note, our governor, uh, Governor May, has recently convened task force on the graduation requirements. These date back quite a while, and we've been extending them out in terms of implementation. So right now in Connecticut, there is a task force hard at work on gathering information and studying the alignment of these changes of the Common Core. And I believe it does, these, this legislation originated back in uh, 2010. So we think that there may be implement implications uh, for our graduation requirements in light of the expansion that we're seeing with mastery-based learning here in Connecticut. In terms of district capacity building, one shoot uh, allowing the option of mastery-based learning the State Board of Education was charged in developing guidelines uh, in effort to build mastery-based pathways in Connecticut. So the State Board had the SDE working on crafting guidelines for MBL, and we had a lot of help, uh, Great Schools Partnership, New England Consortium, New England Consortium of Secondary Schools, and of course our friends Achieve gave us so much technical assistance and support as we did that. So on the ground, uh, my slide actually has a mistake there. I have 30 plus schools in Connecticut moving towards this option. And as of November 1st, it was more like 39. And we keep getting the phone calls and the inquiries about this. So we are really trying to support districts and are, in addition to our guidelines, we have a frequently asked questions page, a communications toolkit is being worked on, and we have a website under development. This year, we're also supporting uh, schools through the League of Innovative Schools of Connecticut. And that support, if I'm thinking of a pyramid, it's kind of a three-tiered system. And we have the classroom level, the school level, and the district level. So there's something for everyone from a superintendent who's interested in mastery-based learning and integrating it with CTE down to the classroom practitioner. Can I have the next slide, please? Quickly, because I think I, I don't want to run over on my time. Uh, what is Connecticut doing in your technical education and the competency-based path? Well, we do have the Connecticut uh, Student Success Plan, which was we were an early adopter with a personalized learning plan. And of note, in the three core components of our Student Success Plan, career development gets its own component. And it's really seen as critical to our Student Success Plan. And the Student Success Plan starts in sixth grade. And we're actually, we want kids to start thinking about not what their own career is, but what they're interested in and doing the exploration. So that by the time they're 16, they have a much better idea of what they're interested in. And they can work on their program of studies as they enter high school. School, and that program of studies would reflect the cluster, the pathway for CTE, and that's going to guide and help our students develop their post-secondary plans. That we're very proud of here in Connecticut, uh, that it has started small, but it's also gaining momentum, is the Carl D. Perkins Innovation Grants. And Connecticut for, oh, I'm exactly sure how many years, because I am new to the department, Department, but for the past several years has been using their reserve funds to do this innovation grant concept. And these 
studies specifically support development of CTE pathways. And we have small numbers, but growing numbers of districts that apply for these grants. And right now, we have a bill that uses uh, CTE pathways, mastery baseline curriculum unit development. With our senior demonstration project in a CTE area. And we've also had previous models on promoting CTE career pathways with student success plan. Likely, uh, we do see in our technical school system, which is 17 schools that are separate from our comprehensive school system, they are working into. Uh, based learning and they're delivering Algebra 1 to their higher freshman group in 17 schools uh, using a mastery based model. We have our Connecticut American Apprenticeship Initiative going to use uh, the competency based apprenticeship model and possibly a combination, a hybrid with the competency based and time based. So that is also the interesting to see that employers um, are going to embrace that apprenticeship model. So at this time, I'm just going to give you a spotlight on one school that is doing such an outstanding job with TE in the medical career way. So if we could just have the next slide. So Brookfield High School, I'm not going to read through everything, but they have they have availed themselves of resources as they try to connect the dots and really see that their students are college and career ready. It, what they are really doing a great job with is a medical careers pathway. And they've got not only are they uh, integrating their instruction, their technical content, you're seeing it in multiple areas. They've worked hard to do curriculum mapping. And you see on their curriculum maps, they have options for where the students are going to hit the competencies. Uh, they also even include their career and technical student organization as an avenue uh, to meet competencies with the uh, future healthcare professionals and the competitions and the tests that students participate in that because they have a vital, vital CTSO at uh, Brookfield High School. So they've, they've been working on uh, excuse me, curriculum mapping and they have a strong CTSO and they have the big uh, ELO with the internships, their medical internships. It's very interesting because Brookfield High School isn't the only school doing this. They're in a consortium with other schools across Connecticut from Fairfield County, New Haven County, and Litchfield County. And there are about 100 students that do this uh, from the nine sending schools each year. And this has been going on since 1994, and it has evolved over time. And uh, the students, it's a highly competitive it's These medical internships, these are for and women in the medical field, and relationships uh, with three area schools, doctors' offices. Um, really, they've worked that outreach to the community uh, has been fabulous. And they do this, the overseer is someone from one of the, the rooms here in Connecticut, and it's a when we talk about relevance uh, in CE, this is what it's all about. These students are doing uh, an online blog articles to read with other kids from around Connecticut, and they're also working at their sites depending upon their interest, uh, different focuses for different people. And this year, field is getting 
a Carl D. Perkins Innovation Grant for a senior demonstration project in a pathway, and they're really looking at uh, quite a few students taking their medical internship and taking it another step further with their internship. So they're going to kind of combine the classroom work in academic and the CTE that are integrated with the internship with the CTSO. And I think, uh, next slide, I think that's it for me, actually. Much to both, both and Tom for your great explanations of the work happening in in Oregon. Um, so we're going to actually jump to audience questions and answers right now. I did see one question came in from uh, one participant: Are the terms competency, mastery, and proficiency synonymous? Um, so I, I might actually field that one first, and anyone else can chime in if the, if they'd like to. Um, but uh, from a chief's perspective, we've been working across 12 different states and also connected with other states. Um, interested in, in this work, and there have been a wide range of different uh, terms used to really mean, mean the same thing. I think at the core of this work is uh, promoting students based on demonstration of mastery or competency or whatever you want to call it, but um, that, that really does undergird all of these different, uh, these different terms. Um, however, I, I will note that there are differences in um, how each of these are, are defined and what are the major implications um, related to, to each of them, depending on which state context you're working in. Um, so uh, anyone else want to chime in on that one? Let me just say quickly that what matters is that you have a consistent and shared definition within your own state, within your own local community. That's what matters the most, and being sure there's a clear understanding of what and recognizing that across states there really is not just a range of words, but a range of what it means, a continuum of efforts around implementing competency-based pathways and policies from very incremental to very evolutionary. And so, uh, again, we would encourage you from a messaging and communication standpoint to make sure there's a shared vision and language with stakeholders in your own communities and focus on that first. Great. Questions come in. Um, I'm the one. What what standards set? Uh, what standards do you use for the various CTE pathways that inform the measure of mastery? I think that's for both Sue and uh, Tom. What standards are being used within these CTE pathways? This is Tom. We're, uh, we're talking about the uh, the content standards, um, the math, the language arts. Uh, in Oregon, is a uh, Common Core state, so we. Those are the state standards. The next generation science standards are, are part of, have been adopted. From the uh, CTE side, uh, the standards that we're using, uh, we've, we have a blend of things with the Common Career Technical Core and, uh, and things that were developed through business and industry locally. Uh, we're blending those together as people work with them. Work is, kind of, is stretched beyond the standards. We've been using standards for a number of years, and so when I was focusing on things like assessment, we realized that no matter what the standards were, the it was it, just simply checking off standards was not was not working, and so we needed to really focus on how well students were meeting those standards and what kind of instructional strategies. In Connecticut, we are also a Common Core state, so our Connecticut Core standards. Uh, are the academic standards there that we are using, and the CTE standards. Consultants in office have gone through, and on our website, they've used many industry, industry standards uh, to align. To, and I'm just I'm looking quickly uh, to find the ones for healthcare to just give that as an example on my curriculum map, and I'm finding it, um, but those would be industry standards. We have a question about the Oregon's ACE Academy. Tom, is it a program specific or eligible for at-risk student students, or are we talking about all students? The multi-district program, so multiple districts add into it. It's open to everybody. It actually started as a charter program. Um, it, uh, so it is as far as its enrollment, um, and uh, 
interesting. I didn't have enough time to really talk about it, but I called them the stress test for proficiency-based education because their entire system was based on that. And they're realizing that there were pieces that were still not in place and were not working as effectively as they would have wanted to. So taking a little hiatus from that as they start to dig into those pieces. So we do have a few more questions, but I do want to reserve time for Steve to share his, his reflections as well. So we're going to jump to, um, we actually have two more poll questions to uh, engage the audience. Um, the first one is, what additional resources would best support your work as you get involved in aligning these systems? So the poll question should be popping up right now. Just a few seconds to answer this one. I'll be sharing the screen right now, and you should see it right on the in the poll section. Um, it looks like yet again we are pretty much dead even across multiple um, multiple answers. Uh, examples of practice, examples of policy, research on promoting specific practices um, seem to be the the winners. Um, I, I was hoping you guys would make this easy on us and just pick one of them, um, but it's nice to know that there's interest in a whole range of supports to support this work. Um, so. We'll give one more poll question for you. This one is, based on today's conversation uh, and your own experiences, which areas must the field address to better align CT and CBP? Um, that one should be showing up in two seconds. The, the responses range from aligned vision, policy changes, clarification, Capacity building supports for educators, transparent, uh, transparent and accessible data and reporting systems, or quality control mechanisms and supports. And that should be open right now. Again, we are all over the place on this one. Uh, we have pretty pretty much a dead heat between aligned vision, policy change, clear communications, capacity building, uh, transparent and accessible data and reporting systems, and quality control mechanisms. So um, just, just uh, yet again that there's a lot of work to be done in this space and we have a lot of things to figure out. I'm going to turn it over now to Steve to offer a few fun reflections on that he's seen within this work on um, where the field really needs to go to advance it. Over. Great, thanks, Drew. Uh, and thanks for inviting me to participate today. Uh, you know, the topic of competency-based education has been something that our association and our CTE community has talked about for some time. We actually had a paper in 2006, I was looking back to the files, called Reinventing the American High School for the 21st Century, and we talked in that paper of the need for uh, a true standards-based approach to education that really required moving away from Carnegie-based unit into uh, measures which were more about the outputs. And so I want to commend uh, both Achieve and the State Director's Organization for working on the report, and also Connecticut and Oregon. I know this is not easy work. <laughs> you know, anything new requires work, and they've obviously begun that discussion and are already making progress in their states. So. Uh, hope is that there's going to be more folks who follow in what they've done. Um, looking back through the paper itself, I just wanted to underscore a few themes that I thought were important. And I'm, I, you know, I'm going to probably be a little duplicative here, but I thought alignment, first of all, is, is so critical. And one of the things we've talked about in the CTU community for a long time is the fact that career education and really all, all 
the different sectors within a school exist in silos and it, it don't always work together as they should. Uh, and I think there's going to be need to have to be more intention to really get um, sectors working together, and and that's part of what I think we're going to need really new practitioners and what their needs will be. It's going to there's going to be a need additional professional development and training and support to help them understand how to work more collaboratively because this type of approach is going to, is going to require more of that. Uh, you know, our organizations and many organizations are talking about really a new paradigm in education that we're focused just on academics or technical skills, but as a student you need to have both of those along with those 21st century or employability skills and to do that all going to have to be working closer together. And then the other thing I would highlight is individualized uh, and student-led learning. You know, when I think back to my own education, uh, it's really about your, your personal passion and what you want to follow to get you into a career and into life skills that you need. And, and we as educators need to be listening to the students and providing that early exploration, as Connecticut mentioned. I was so happy to hear that mention, that there's career development and exploration early on to help students work towards that end goal. Um, and I think in closing, I would just say that this is about both policy and practice. Uh, so the policies that Connecticut and Oregon in place are helping to support practice, uh, and this really has to be about the practice side too, that we all have to work together collaboratively, uh, and we change our thinking quite a bit in some areas in order to meet these new goals. So thanks very much. Before we close out, I do want to mention a few key themes or key considerations that we tried to pull out and build off your, your thoughts. Um, so we, we, all, we encourage you to, to check out the brief for additional key questions, um, but a few that really have emerged um, over the, the course of these conversations that we wanted to draw attention to um, were, first, as states are really building a common vision across CT and CPP, uh, it's really important that all stakeholders are involved in that transition ha and have a strong understanding of uh, sorry, changes that they'll need to pursue. Um, and a, a first step in promoting such changes to be really clear on what the rationale is, what is the problem you're trying to solve by promoting alignment, and what are what are the outcomes you're you're hoping to achieve? Uh, are there specific consequences in a system that's not aligned? Uh, how can you really sell the idea that we need to promote this stronger alignment. Um, second, even if there is buy-in across multiple stakeholders, it's really important to consider how CT fits as uh, a part of your state's overall CBP vision. Is it embedded into legislation? Is it um, included within regulation uh, or your co capacity building efforts? If not, where are you embedded to um, promote greater alignment? And then, then last, the development of competency-based pathways that fully integrate CTE will require significant capacity building. Um, you should consider what types of supports as a state you can offer. Are there opportunities for um, targeted technical assistance, resource development, building communities of, pra of practice across educators and district leaders? Um, furthermore, what, what processes will your state have in place in order to ensure rigor um, across these, these multiple uh, pathways. So those are just a few questions um, that we wanted to draw your attention to. Um, if you're interested in more, definitely check out the brief. And I'd like to take this opportunity to now to um, just uh, contact available for everyone and thank everyone, the participants who joined us on the, the phone call today. Um, it was fantastic to hear the work happening at the state level and then also in include national partners. And uh, I'd be remiss if I, I didn't and thank Kate and the state directors for being such incredible, incredible partners in promoting this work. Um, lastly, slides and a recording of the webinar will be available afterwards, and we encourage the, any audience members to reach out to um, either Kate or myself or any of the presenters um, should you have follow-up questions that you'd like to address. So with that, we can actually let you off four minutes early today. Um, thank you all, and have a wonderful day. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's conference. Thank you for participating, and we now disconnect.